Section 42 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. The American Book of the Dog. G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 42. The Poodle by W. R. Furness. A few years ago, if you told a doggy man, either in this country or England, that he owned a poodle, he repudiated the charge immediately and felt deeply insulted, as these dogs were deemed fit only for the circus or for mountebanks. Now, I am happy to say, these truly noble dogs have become better known, and their real sterling qualities are beginning to be appreciated. The origin of the poodle is not known, though he certainly belongs to the spaniel family, and his special characteristics have been developed by climate and the particular uses for which he has been required. There is, however, little doubt that he is, comparatively speaking, a modern dog. The first mention of him is by Conrad Gessner in 1555, and Dr. Fitzinger in Der Hund und Sein Rassen says, I quote from The Poodle by Wildfowler in Stonehenge's Dogs of the British Islands, that Der Gross Poodle originated in the northwest of Africa, probably in Morocco or Algeria, and that the origin of the schnorr poodle or corded poodle has been a matter of discussion among savants some saying that he came from spain or portugal others that he came from greece but from these two dogs if they were originally distinct came all our modern classes of poodles of which there are four the russian poodle the german poodle the french poodle or caniche and the barbet. Mephistopheles first appeared to Faust in the form of a black poodle, and Littre, in his Dictionnaire Francais, says that the dogs of Ulysses were barbets, though by this he probably meant dogs from Barbary, like our large poodles, and not the little woolly dogs which now go by that name. Of the four varieties of poodles, the largest is the Russian which is quite rare both in this country and England. The usual color is black, but they are sometimes white or black and white. They are rather leggy dogs, the head long and wedge-shaped with very little stop. The eyes, in the best specimens, dark red, but many otherwise good dogs have yellowish eyes. The ears are set on rather high and lie close to the cheeks. The legs are straight and muscular. The feet rather splayed and webbed halfway down the toes. The coat is long, coarse, and almost wiry, showing little inclination to curl and none at all to cord, like that of the German poodle. This, I think, probably comes from some admixture of Russian setter blood. These dogs are bold, hardy, and excessively courageous, but inclined to be too excitable and intolerant of restraint in the field. The German poodle, which is really the type of the family, is a powerful, compactly built dog with a deep, narrow brisket, in shape not unlike that of the greyhound. A strong loin, slightly arched, with a good square back. Powerful hindquarters to propel him through the water, for the poodle is almost an amphibian. Round and compact feet, with the toes webbed all the way to the nail. The head is wedge-shaped, like that of the Russian poodle, but shows more stop and more cheeks, is very broad and almost flat between the ears, giving the dog great brain capacity, with the sense bump or occiput strongly marked. The eyes should be rather small, placed far apart, 
and should show the great intelligence and sprightliness. A stupid expression in a poodle should, in my opinion, condemn him at once. The ears should be long and pendulous, set rather low on the skull, the leather reaching to the tip of the nose when stretched out, but hanging along the neck when the head is erect. The lips should be close and thin, barely covering the incisors. The nose in black specimens should be coal black, in white ones a dark pinkish brown. The neck should be bony, muscular, and so set into the long sloping shoulders as to enable the dog when swimming to carry whatever he is retrieving well above the water, and it is really astonishing how heavy a weight a poodle can carry without any apparent inconvenience. There is a peculiar suppleness in the poodle's back when he is either swimming or running, and which gives him the appearance of being able to flex his spine more than any other dog that I know of. Whether or not it is this which gives him his extraordinary power in the water, I cannot say, but he certainly excels all his race in that element at least being able to distance the strongest water spaniel and swim round and round a Newfoundland. In nose, the German poodle almost rivals the bloodhound, and so keen is his power of scent that he can trail his master through the most crowded street or retrieve a wounded bird, no matter how cleverly it may hide. In color, the German poodle is black, white, black and white, and occasionally liver-colored, though the last, to my mind, should always be looked upon with suspicion as showing a strain of spaniel blood. In black dogs the eye should be a dark, rich red, and in white ones a dark brown. In Germany, where these dogs are kept solely for use, color is not deemed of such consequence, but in this country and England solid black or white are considered absolutely essential. A few years ago, black was by far the rarer color, but lately, since black poodles have become fashionable, many more of them are seen, though if a thorough examination be made, it will be found that at least fifty per cent have either a white star on the breast, a white lower lip, or a white toe or two. In coat, the German poodle differs from every other dog, inasmuch as the hairs should felt or cord, to use the technical term, in the long strings, slightly knotty and wavy, and of about the thickness of a crow quill, though they are often seen much thicker. But this is due to lack of care when the coat is growing. The entire coat, from the base of the skull to the root of the tail, should divide evenly down the back, showing a clearly defined parting, and should touch the ground, completely hiding the forelegs and feet, and thus, combined with the cords from the throat and chest, give the dog the appearance of being in petticoats. Whether or not this enormous amount of coat is all composed of living hair, I have never been able to satisfactorily determine but I strongly suspect that where we see extraordinarily long and closely felted cords, and I have seen one dog who, though only eighteen inches in height, had cords on his shoulders twenty-one inches long, the greater portion of them is old and dead coat, especially as toward spring many cords show a disposition to become attenuated at about one inch from the root and to come away with a slight pull, causing the dog no pain, which certainly would not be the case if the hare were alive. So decided is the tendency of the German poodle's coat to cord, that even if you should comb it out, an almost impossible task, with a few hearty shakes it divides up into separate locks, and in a few days is so felted as to almost defy the comb again. The coat should cord all over the body, 
except in the eyebrows, mustache, and imperial, which should be straight, even without wave, and of a glossier texture than the rest of the coat. The cords on the ears should reach far down on the shoulders, and so mingle with those of the neck, as to render the ears nearly indistinguishable. On the head, the cords should all fall away from the center, leaving a well-defined crown, and should have no tendency to stand erect, like those of a water spaniel. The tail, which is usually docked, should be perfectly straight, and carried at an angle of about seventy degrees with the back. Many poodles have curled tails, and an otherwise good dog should not be debarred for that fault. I once had an excellent dog whose tail had not been cut, and it curled as tight as that of any pug. By cutting his tail and giving it careful attention, he acquired an excellent carriage, and a great improvement in appearance, much to my satisfaction, if not to his. In Germany, where these are almost the only retrievers used, it is customary in summer to cut off the coat for the greater comfort of the dog, leaving the hair on the head, breast, and feet only, for the protection of these delicate parts, and from this custom has arisen the present fashion of shaving poodles, and to such an extent has this been carried, that in most shows the artistic shaving of a poodle is not without weight with the judges. And though the straps and tufts of hair seem at first sight to be merely the vagaries of fashion, yet on closer examination it will be seen that they all have their uses and add considerably to the symmetry of the animal in emphasizing curves and suppressing angles and certainly the rakish mustache and imperial combined with the venerable eyebrows and intelligent eyes of a well-shaved poodle give to his face a quaint air i give on following pages a diagram for shaving a poodle in the style generally adopted in england and which is best adapted to showing off the dog to the greatest advantage many people allow the cords of the straps and tufts to grow to their full capacity but this is i think a mistake they should be cut about two and a half inches in length and kept combed as far as is possible to make them stand out more clearly, and also to show the texture of the coat. The shoulders, breast, and ears should show its cording qualities quite well enough. The French poodle, or caniche, derived from the word canard, a duck, was, and is still in some districts of France, the only ducking dog or retriever used and is most admirably adapted to that work, as his courage and sagacity prompt him to brave all sorts of weather, and his thick woolly coat, by retaining air, buoys him up and retains animal heat when he is in the water. In most respects he is like the German poodle, though generally a smaller and more slightly built dog than his Teutonic cousin. The colors of caniches are the same as those of the German poodle, and solid colors are deemed absolutely essential for a good dog. The skull should show a well-defined stop, very broad across the ears, and with a pronounced dome. The eyes should be larger in proportion than in the German poodle, should be of a clear dark red in black dogs, of a dark brown in white specimens, and without any inclination to weep. The ears should be set on rather high, the leather seldom reaching to the tip of the nose. The neck should be moderately long, and the shoulders rather upright, the barrel well ribbed up with strong arched loins. The feet should be round, slightly splayed, with the toes webbed down to the nails. The legs should be long and muscular. The hind ones are usually rather straighter than those of the German poodle, thereby giving the dog a proud, though rather stilty, action when walking. 
the coat all over the body should separate into tightly curled ringlets but with no tendency to cord in france it is not customary to shave poodles as elaborately as is done in england and the majority of caniches that you see have only the moustache imperial wristlets and anklets with perhaps a back strap and tufts they are also shaved much higher up the body nearly to the shoulder while german poodles are never shaved farther forward than the last rib for many years the poodle has been the national dog of france and no cartoonist would think of drawing a picture of johnny crapaud without his caniche sitting on its hind legs beside him and indeed it is this dog's innate love of fun and drollery in contrast to his very wise and dignified expression that particularly endears him to a frenchman's heart the barbet is or should be a miniature caniche though the head is always larger in proportion and is inclined to be too round the ears are long pendulous and should reach to the tip of the nose the color should be white though many good dogs are seen with fawn markings especially on the ears and back the legs are strong well set under the body with the hind ones as in the caniche a little too straight for real beauty the body should be strong and well ribbed up giving the dog a firm cobby appearance a long weak loin is a great blemish the tail is long, slightly curled, and usually docked. The eyes should be large, full, and nearly perfectly black, and should show very little inclination to weep. The coat should, as in the caniche, show light ringlets, but at the same time should be somewhat fluffier, with a beautifully white and glossy appearance as weight is of great importance in barbets a good dog should not exceed six and one-half pounds and as much less as is compatible with a good shape and should not stand much over eight inches at the shoulder these dogs are of course utterly useless as sporting dogs but show a remarkable aptitude for learning tricks and have extraordinary strength and agility for such frail-looking little creatures their tempers are apt to be a little uncertain for though they are nearly all docile to their master or mistress they are prone to be snappish to strangers and like all small dogs to have a great idea of their own importance if it were not for these traits they would be an almost perfect lady's lap-dog barbets are usually shaved like caniches and the tail is generally docked poodles no matter of what variety are quite difficult dogs to rear and he may esteem himself lucky who has two-thirds of his puppies reach maturity for they seem on the slightest provocation to contract every ill that dog flesh is heir to in the first place great care should be taken in selecting the sire and dam and the pedigrees of both ascertained as fully as possible for the modern poodle like most of our manufactured dogs if i may be allowed that expression has a great tendency to breed back and indeed in nine cases out of ten it is but a waste of time and money to get a poodle dog and bitch of unknown genealogy and expect to get good puppies the faults are usually in the coat which is either too flat or too woolly or in the head which is either too coarse or too snipey but supposing we have a thoroughbred dog and bitch our troubles are only just beginning in the first place while the bitch is in whelp she should be allowed perfect liberty as nearly as possible and this i regard as almost essential she should have a clean dry bed of pine shavings or straw away from other dogs and such disturbing causes and should have a plentiful supply of good nourishing food 
though unless the weather is cold but a small amount of meat and that raw or at least very rare her coat may be brushed and corded as usual but while she is in whelp i would not advise shaving a tolerably long coat will be more comfortable for her and for the puppies especially if the weather is at all cold as her time approaches be sure that she is satisfied with her quarters for if she is not when the little strangers appear she will try to carry them elsewhere and if not allowed to do so will fret lose her milk neglect her puppies and so cause them to die after the litter is born the bitch will need but little attention for about an hour by which time she will have cleaned her little family and will have time to think about herself let her have a pan of water not too cold and then if she will take it a little oatmeal gruel and milk place it far enough from her nest to make her leave her puppies but not so far as to make her feel anxious about them after an interval of about five hours or even less give her some more gruel with perhaps a little bread and gravy or some such nourishing food now for the first time examine the puppies harden your heart and decide which are to be given to the bucket and which to the world remember that you stand more chance of getting four good dogs if you leave but five with her than if you leave eight from this time until the puppies are weaned feed her plentifully three times a day is none too often remember you are feeding many mouths and very greedy ones at that after about six weeks take her away from the puppies but do not move them as any change is likely to give them cold and allow her to be with them for an hour or so each day to draw off what milk she may have left and that she may clean and care for her family when the puppies are eight weeks old they may have a run in the open air of about an hour each clear day and even at this early age they had better make the acquaintance of the clippers shave their feet because if they get them wet they dry more readily if the long hair is cut off and so avoid colds or distemper shave also their faces as in my opinion it strengthens their eyes and keeps them from weeping from this time on no particular treatment is necessary keep them dry and clean with a plentiful supply of food but give them no milk that has not first been boiled on account of worms to which parasites these dogs seem peculiarly susceptible when about five months old if it be summer give them their first entire clipping and cord and brush their coats as best you can but do not be discouraged if they do not seem to cord as they should that will come later and indeed but few poodles attain a really good coat until two years old pay particular attention that the coat does not felt into thick wads along the brisket and under the ears if these are found they should be carefully pulled apart beginning next the skin and separated into cords of the proper size about one-fifth of an inch in diameter and twirled between the finger and thumb until they lie apart go over the entire coat and you will probably find many locks composed of two or three cords joined together throughout the greater part of their length but with the ends separate seize these ends and with a firm pull divide them down to the skin but never cut them apart as that tends to kill the hair and make it turn of a rusty color after going over the coat thoroughly and on your thoroughness in this particular depends its future quality rub in the following mixture one part kerosene one part olive oil one part castor oil hand rub until nearly all greasiness disappears use a brush sparingly always rubbing or brushing with the hair 
comb out the mustache and imperial rub with a stiff brush all the shaved part to remove scurf or dandruff and your poodle is or should be in pretty good condition in fitting poodles for the bench many breeders first clip them and then shave them with a razor to my mind this practice is to be deprecated in the first place it is painful to the dog and no matter how skillful he may be the operator is likely to take out a few nicks especially on the face where the skin is most wrinkled and in the second place it not only does not add to the beauty of the dog but conceals an important point in his coat viz the close wave which should be seen a few days after clipping on the back of a first-class poodle giving it the appearance of watered silk for my part if i were going to show a really first-class dog i would rather clip him as close as possible three days before he was to appear before the judges and take my chances against an equally good dog that had been shaved the day before great care should be taken in keeping a poodle free from fleas as he does terrible damage to his peculiar knotted coat by constant scratching and also by the constant irritation induces surfeit or some other skin disease which is exceedingly difficult to cure in a poodle on account of the difficulty of applying any wash directly to the skin if you notice that your dog seems restless and is constantly scratching or biting himself get a gallon of sheep dip which can be bought from most fanciers dilute it with fifteen gallons of water bathe the dog thoroughly in this mixture allow it to remain on for three days then wash clean using very little soap and you may reasonably hope for a cure poodles are also subject to canker in the ear for this the best advice i can give i think is that you go at once to the best veterinary surgeon that you can find but do not attempt any experiments yourself further than putting a cap on the dog so that he cannot scratch the cords off his ear or by constant shaking of his head bring on external canker which is difficult to cure these two ailments surfeit and canker are the ones from which poodles are most liable to suffer and both may be avoided by ordinary care as regards diet and cleanliness for though difficult to rear when he has once reached maturity there is no dog so healthy or hardy as a poodle he is also in my opinion more susceptible of education than any other member of his race seeming to have an innate love for tricks and needing only to understand what you wish to do it immediately and then enjoy the fun of it as much as you do yet notwithstanding his wonderful intelligence the greatest patience is required in teaching each new trick remember that he is even more anxious to understand you than you are to make him comprehend what you wish and that a word of encouragement or a friendly pat on the head goes ten times as far as a scolding or a blow at the same time bear in mind that the greatest firmness is required for if the dog for a moment suspects that your whole heart and soul are not in the matter he at once thinks it must be of small consequence and loses all interest in it forthwith make him think that you are both doing something for mutual amusement and he will respond and do everything in his power to follow out your wishes provided he is already firmly attached to you and in this lies the secret of success or failure in all training for as he cannot understand your language he must know by heart all your gestures and intonations remember what a very wide space divides us from even the most intelligent dog and as he is our servant we force him to study us much more than we study him and to make his lower intellect travel over more than half that wide space and even then not get credit for having done much 
and after all to be made to feel that if he has misinterpreted a word or a sign he has disappointed the one creature in the world that he most wished to please another important point in training a poodle is on account of his inquisitive and excitable temperament to have him amidst familiar surroundings and without any exciting causes most professional dog trainers i believe give their pupils lessons at two or three a m only as at that time greater stillness reigns but this i do not think is absolutely essential and need not be followed out by the amateur who does not require such a high degree of proficiency as does the professional though as a rule other dogs should not be present when a pupil is learning a new trick an old dog who already knows it is often useful as an interpreter and seems to be able to communicate our wishes to the poor perplexed pupil and finally never attempt to teach two tricks at once unless you wish to see an utterly bewildered and unhappy looking dog it is an intelligent dog that can learn one trick a day and know all his tricks thoroughly and the average dog cannot master over two or three a week but each trick learned makes the next one easier as we get more and more en rapport with our eager intelligent little servant the poodle appended is the comparative scale for judging poodles skull value ten ears value ten legs and feet value fifteen coat value twenty eyes value five tail value ten color value fifteen symmetry value fifteen total one hundred there are but few breeders of poodles in this country among these the following are noted l e wilmerding thirty two east thirty ninth street new york city Prescott Lawrence, 196 Madison Avenue, New York City. W. C. Sanford, Amsterdam, New York. George S. Mott, Babylon, Long Island, New York. Robert McKinley, 49 West 18th Street, New York City. A. W. Purbeck, Box 244, Salem, Massachusetts c a baldwin union club new york city g w fairchild four twenty one west fifty seventh street new york city f e perkins providence rhode island c f leland seven beck hall cambridge massachusetts t m alley twelve forty wilcox avenue chicago illinois c e hill five fourteen rialto building chicago illinois l biddle philadelphia pennsylvania dr samuel g dixon fifty eighth street and elmwood avenue philadelphia pennsylvania william ryring ten cook street cincinnati ohio end of section forty two Recording by Roger Moline.